Hello everyone, and welcome to the Getting Started video for Introducing Python. Introducing Python is a small course and a series of uh, lecture notes that have been compiled as a uh, online book uh, that you can use in order to get started with Python. Uh, this will cover some of the introductory elements of Python, such as how to uh, first interact with Python through a variety of ways, and in this video we will look at how to install Python and uh, get access to some of the materials, uh, and then goes through things like uh, what is data, how do we use it, how do we use collections of data, how do we manage the flow through a program, uh, and then getting into some uh, little bit of higher order abstractions, like what's a function, what's an object, what's a method, and then how to uh, write things to uh, the computer and how to receive things back from the computer and reading them as files. So that's not really going to uh, get you as far as you might want to get in terms of analyzing data or making use of Python, but it should provide the effective framework or groundwork for you to be able to use this work uh, and extend it with additional lessons and materials. Uh, this book has also been, uh, it's to me seen as kind of a prologue uh, to my own book, From Social Science to Data Science, uh, which is uh, follows a similar sort of structure, uh, whereby we have chapters that are exercises on GitHub, uh, YouTube videos for you to follow along, uh, and some exercises that you can do uh, along the way. Uh, that book is available from Sage, but all of the um, resources uh, that you would need, such as the uh, code, worksheets, and exercises, are, uh, like this, freely available on GitHub. This particular video is going to go through the prologue and the first chapter of this uh, of this book, and uh, that's basically involving just orienting yourself to the programs that we're going to use in order to run Python. Uh, it's going to walk through how to install those programs and how to download all the resources using GitHub. If you already have access to these resources, uh, have Python set up in some way, uh, particularly through Jupyter, Jupyter Lab, or Jupyter Notebook, you may want to skip this getting started, but you may also find some interesting nuggets, uh, uh, tips, and or tricks uh, that uh, you'll see uh, along the way. So the first thing to note is that uh, I have in behind me here uh, a web page for GitHub. Now GitHub is a repository where people can upload code and others can download that code. Uh, when someone downloads that code, then they have a version of it on their computer. If they are part of the repository team, they can then push back new versions of that code back up to the GitHub website. So in theory, I could uh, update some of these notebooks, uh, push them up here, and then there would be an updated version there. Uh, you, however, in downloading or cloning this repository down to your own, uh, down to your own computer, uh, would not be able to uh, push the uh, code back up so you have no worries about when you are downloading this that you're going to somehow interfere with the uh, with the repository or otherwise muck about with it. It also means that if you uh, do something in some of your code that you've downloaded uh, and you uh, you want to refresh that you can go to the github page and individually download uh, fresh versions of this or check out the entire GitHub archive itself, uh, but that gets a bit more complicated uh, and uh, is uh, what we would refer to as version control, something that's a little out of scope of this. Let's just think of this as a nice repository that you can uh, you can download code from, and we're going to show how to do that along with how to run the code uh, as we go through the video. So to give a tour here, I'm on this page here that shows introducing python.pdf, uh, and uh, this is a uh, this is a version of the very same uh, chapters that uh, you'll see uh, later on as code, uh, except it's been formatted as a book using the software called LaTeX. LaTeX is a typesetting program, and we won't see too much of LaTeX here, but it is worth uh, having uh, a little bit of familiarity with it as we go along, because we'll see that we do borrow some bits from LaTeX in terms of formatting things within the, uh, uh, within the notebook exercises that we're, we're working. But let's not worry about LaTeX for now. Let's just assume that uh, it was the way that I created this PDF from the code. Now, what do we mean by code? If we go here and you see on the, uh, the side, um, what we're looking at here says files, chapters, exercises, LaTeX, and PDF. Uh, if we go into chapters uh, down here for this book, uh, you'll see uh, here are the chapters of the book, and then below are the exercises. They say IPy and B. That refers to IPython, which is a kind of Python that has been uh, developed and evolved uh, for more interactive programming uh, than just running a single script on a computer and getting the results. Interestingly, on GitHub, uh, you can, in fact, click on these right here uh, and uh, read them, and you'll see that they are uh, they're kind of notebooks that have been formatted themselves. Uh, at this point, I'm going to sort of 
make my screen just a little bit smaller up here in the corner, uh, and I hope I'm still visible. So we see here, uh, this is an example of a notebook. This is chapter two. You'll also notice here at the top are these two uh, uh, little buttons here, launch binder and opening collab. This is because you can in fact run these, uh, you can run these as notebooks. They are executable notebooks. Down here we have some code and in between we have some text. Uh, Binder is a service that's uh, provided by a consortium of academics, including uh, the Turing Institute here in the UK. Uh, and uh, Collab is a platform from uh, Google Research. If you click on opening Collab, you'll see uh, that it takes the exact URL right here and it draws from that, it pulls that in uh, into Collab. Now Collab, we have this, and this would be a way in which you can run that code without having to run it locally on your computer. But we will run it locally on our computer. For what it's worth, you also need to sign in to Google in order to run this code, even though Collab can help you visualize it, even if you are anonymous. Uh, what you'll see here is that uh, I'm not signed in. In fact, this is an entirely fresh install uh, or a fresh user on my uh, on my computer. And that's so that we can walk through the, the things together. I won't simply tell you what to download, but we'll show you how it's done. So now if I press this and we say, run this, it says you are a... Uh, you must be logged in with your Google account to continue. So I'm not going to bother do that right now. Uh, I think it's more useful, at least when learning, for us to see how to run this uh, locally. So going back here, we have a uh, GitHub, and uh, we're going to want to uh, download this repository. But before we do that, uh, I recommend we will uh, first download the software that we're going to use to run this, uh, uh, run this program. And we can find uh, that software through this place here, anaconda.com. So, you know, Python, Anaconda, I guess that's where it comes from. And uh, you'll see it says the operating system of AI, very, you know, so forth. If we go to the free download here, uh, it'll get us down to the download. Uh, and it also, of course, is trying to upsell us some coding in the cloud, but let's do the download here. Uh, now, for what it's worth for Mac, uh, some of you may have, uh, if you have a computer from the last three or four years, it probably has an M1 processor. And I would strongly recommend that you download the M1 version. But uh, either version uh, should work on your computer if you run Intel computer, this would be a, a MacBook, MacBook Air, that sort of thing from, uh, I guess, a little over four years ago, uh, then you'll want, you'll definitely need the Intel version because the M1 version uh, won't work. Uh, for Windows, uh, there should just be one version, and it will be automatic that it'll just say download for Windows. Uh, but if you have any doubt about things like bits and stuff, you should download the 64-bit version of this. So selecting the download, it's, uh, it's pretty big. And uh, we'll uh, click on that there, download for M1. Uh, waiting for the download to complete, it's almost a gigabyte, uh, and this suggests also to remind that in order to continue this, uh, you're going to need at least a good 5 gigabytes free space on your computer. Now, if you only have 5 gigabytes free space on your computer, that's not really a good idea because the computer itself needs to save some files uh, along the way and sort of save the state from RAM and so forth. So really, I would recommend not doing this with less than 15 gigabytes free on your computer to uh, have it run comfortably. And we can see here that this is uh, open and downloaded for me. So uh, I will look for this in my finder. It's under downloads. Uh, double click and start the installer. So now the installer here says uh, it's a package that will run. I, I select allow. That's OK. I continue. And I'm going to just select all the defaults. Uh, you're welcome to read the user agreement, but I've already read that in past myself. Uh, and I strongly recommend installing for me only. This will put this within your local home directory. And we'll see more about the home directory now in a minute. So it says the install time remaining is less than a minute, but in my experience, it actually takes a little more than a minute for this to uh, uh, to run the first time we do it. Uh, it might take several minutes. And you'll also notice that once it completes, uh, even before this install package is completed, it's going to open up a program called Anaconda Navigator. Uh, that is a program that shows the various uh, different software that comes down with Anaconda, uh, including the software that we'll be using today. While that's uh, working, I want to show this thing here called Terminal. As you can see, it's, I guess, look up uh, on the uh, fresh install here. Uh, and this is a terminal right here. Uh, if I just select Terminal, it looks like this. And this is a place where you can, uh, you can type text and interact with your computer through that text. Now, if I type in that terminal right here, if I type Python, uh, then it's going to say Command Not Found. Just watch. That's going to change now in a minute once we install all this software. Um, 
what I'm going to recommend is that uh, even though Anaconda Navigator is going to pop up and it's going to say, uh, here's the, uh, the various apps you can use, that we actually use it through the terminal. Now, when the terminal launches, it loads up a set of programs that it thinks are available in that computer. And because we haven't completed this script here, it doesn't know that there's a, a Python command that we can run. However, on Mac computers, uh, there is, in fact, a version of Python already on your computer. If you type Python 3, then indeed, we can have a little console here, and that console is going to allow us to type some Python code. So now if I uh, type in here, uh, print, this is the classic one, hello world, so we, uh, hello uh, earthlings. And uh, you'll see down below it prints, hello earthlings. Oh, and here we go, we have uh, the Anaconda Navigator has indeed popped up just as I uh, suspected. I'm not going to sign into this platform and do that stuff online. I'm just going to have a look at what we have over here. So there's a variety of different uh, programs available. Uh, Visual Studio Code here, which uh, you can download and launch, is a really highly effective uh, coding platform uh, put together by Microsoft. has a lot of smart features to it, and if you're doing uh, coding with uh, a lot of pieces that have to interact together, I would strongly recommend checking out uh, VS Code. But there's other sorts of programs available for this, such as Spider and, uh, and PyCharm. Uh, what, we're be what we will be interested in is uh, Jupyter. And the reason is because Jupyter is a place where we can run those notebooks that we saw a minute ago. We have the choice of either Jupyter Notebook or Jupyter Lab. Jupyter Notebook will run and render a single notebook. So it first starts with a file dialog. You open it, you can select your notebook and run it. Jupyter Lab is a uh, more like a browser in a browser. It will have uh, file tabs and so forth that we can use and run uh, our, our programs in. So I'm not going to launch it here from Anaconda. Uh, in fact, what I'm going to do now is just shut down the Anaconda Navigator. Uh, as we can see here, quit Anaconda Navigator. Yes, and you see it launched even before it uh, started the install or finished the install. OK. And yes, I do want to move that installer to the bin, so it's gone. So now, if you'll notice here, uh, in this console, which I'm going to exit uh, with this uh, with this here exit, and you'll see it has these two brackets at the end. We'll, we'll uh, unpack what those mean later. Uh, but for now, you can see I would type in Jupyter and Lab. But if I do this now, it's not going to work. It's going to say command not found. That's because uh, the terminal loaded up the commands before it started. And so we would have to restart the terminal. Now, if you're on Windows uh, and you do this through, uh, you wouldn't have a thing called a terminal. Instead, you'd have a thing called a shell. And uh, they're, they're effectively the same thing. Uh, so you can run that using a CMD if you uh, type through Windows. But that might not work for you either. What I would recommend is that you check out what's called Anaconda Prompt or Anaconda PowerShell, depending on how recently you uh, you installed Jupyter. Uh, and so under the uh, uh, select the Windows key, type start typing Anaconda, and uh, you'll see Anaconda Navigator will pop up, but avoid that. Uh, and it will also say Anaconda PowerShell. When you select that, something will come up and it'll look almost exactly like this, except it's probably going to be in blue with white text. Um, so now what I'm going to do, like I said, is uh, we'll close that shell, and then I'm going to start a new shell. Uh, you can do that pressing Command-N, but I, I did it through the, uh, the menu on my other screen here. And then I also selected this, uh, this different formatting called Homebrew. I don't know. I guess I just uh, like the look of it. Now if we type in Python, you'll see we have uh, Python up here. And this is a slightly newer version of Python than what we saw before, because it's the one that came down with the Anaconda. And once again, you know, we can do x equals 3, uh, x uh, plus 5, and there we go, let's see, and so forth, and start our calculations. But what I want to do now is uh, launch Jupyter uh, or Jupyter Lab. And so if you launch Jupyter Notebook or Jupyter Lab, it's the same thing. You just type Jupyter, and then I type Lab. Uh, what this is going to do is it's going to run a server on your computer, so then it's going to serve documents to a browser. Uh, now, that browser is not going to be available to people on the web unless you do a lot of configuring uh, in order to like make it available to people on the web. It's only going to be available to you on your local computer. And I say local specifically because, if you'll notice down below, the address for your local computer is called localhost. So when I first uh, press Enter, it's going to take a minute to uh, sort itself out because it's the first time that it's run. And then notice here it just popped up a, uh, a Jupyter Lab window. 
Now that window uh, has uh, both the name of my computer, localhost, and it also has a port up here, 8889. The reason it's 8889 is because uh, on my other account, on my main work account, I'm also running Jupyter, uh, and uh, that will be at port 8888. And you would see that yourself if you, uh, if you click on your browser tab, you should see localhost 8888. If you see something like 8889, 890, that means that you'll have multiple instances of JupyterLab running and they're kind of ticking up uh, so that they're in different ports so they don't get in uh, each other's way. Your computer has many uh, ports and they're registered numbers that uh, expect certain kinds of information coming in uh, from the web. So there's some ports for, um, you know, HTTP uh, data coming down from the web or a port for email, uh, I think that's port 25, uh, and so forth. Uh, lots of programs will have different kind of ports, but we're looking for 8888. Now, if we notice here, uh, like I said, it's a kind of a browser within a browser. Uh, it has, you know, file, edit, review, all this stuff, and we'll cover that in a bit. It also has this way that we can uh, browse our um, uh, browser files on the computer. So, you know, applications, desktop, documents. Now, why did it start here on the home directory, as we can see here? The reason uh, is because we launched it from our home directory in the terminal. If I go over to the terminal here, uh, we can see that it's running. And the first thing we're going to do is stop it. Then I'll show you where we are. And then we're going to run it again. So to stop it, you would hit Control C, uh, which just cancels a um, uh, cancels something up online. It's not going to give you uh, much uh, control over that, but it will give you a warning. Shut down the server. And I'm going to say yes. Oh, I, uh, I took too long there. So let's see. Shut down the server, yes. Okay, so shutting down, confirm, shutting down six extensions and zero terminals, that's important. What that means is that uh, there's there's nothing really running in this JupyterLab notebook. You'll also notice that once I've shut it down, then we see this here, a server connection error. Uh, that means that it's not talking to anything, so it's not gonna be able to run anymore, so it's giving me a warning that maybe I should rerun the server. So I can close that down right now uh, and then go back here and uh, we can launch it again, but before we do that, I want to show where I am on my computer. So here is, uh, here's my computer. Uh, here's this uh, account. It's called Demo Install. If we look up above, uh, we have other accounts on my computer. This is my, you know, my main one right here. There's one for my uh, IT provider and, uh, and so forth and so forth. And this one here has a little home on it for Demo Install. I go in here. Here's my, here's my folders. Now, we can see those folders as well through the terminal. Uh, if I go, uh, I believe, PWD, yes, and that's Present Working Directory. So what that means is that we're in this directory right here, we're, uh, which is the home directory. And so if I launch Jupyter from here, that's going to be the home for Jupyter. However, for example, if I go CD, which is Change Directory, uh, Documents, uh, press Enter, now you see we're in the Documents. Because I'm in a, uh, a new... Uh, install, it's uh, asking for permissions. It says here, Terminal would like to access documents in your Documents folder. I'm going to select OK for that one. So now we have the Documents folder, and I can see what's in there. If I go clicking this way, I go Documents, and we see a, a screen recording uh, right there. That was the, uh, the sound test that I did. Uh, and uh, we can also see that through here. If I go LS for List, LS, and it says just one screen recording. And uh, as you can see, that that happened just shortly before this movie right here. If you're on a Windows computer, uh, depending on whether you're in the command prompt or the PowerShell, ls may or may not work, in which case you would want to type dir for directory. But dir is not going to work on a, a Mac or a, a Linux computer. So now that we've seen that, uh, let me open up JupyterLab, except this time I'm going to open it up here within the documents just so that we can see the contrast. You'll notice because we never had anything running, it, it took the next available port, which again was 8889. And we have all of our stuff here on the side, which I'll uh, zoom in so you can see uh, a little better. And indeed, our, now our home directory is documents and it only sees the screen recording. If I put a new folder in here, which I'll call demo, press enter, uh, then that will also show up in uh, our files right here, see it's in demos, and you could see it through the terminal as well if we uh, if we went and listed right there. But where are the files for introducing Python? 
Well, they're available online and you can download them. You can download them one by one should you choose to do so. However, uh, I would strongly recommend that you download them through, um, uh, through GitHub in using a, uh, what's called cloning a repository. So you take all the stuff that's online and bring it down to your computer. Now there are several ways to clone a repository and if you search for that online, uh, then, uh, then you may find uh, that some people will recommend doing it through the terminal itself. Uh, I like doing it through the terminal, although we're not going to do it here. I think it's a little simpler for us to download the GitHub desktop app uh, and install from there. Also, you may see some people recommending uh, doing it directly in JupyterLab. Indeed, Jupyter has this thing here, which is a set of extensions, or extension manager, uh, in which case you can install a GitHub extension and uh, use the repository uh, that way. However, um, like I said here, I am going to uh, go instead to the GitHub desktop and uh, use this. So this is desktop.github.com. It will be an application that we can download and run on our computer that will manage uh, uh, what's called a, a version control systems and mainly the GitHub uh, version control system. But there's other uh, version control systems available out there and there's other platforms than GitHub which uh, manage source code. So if I select download from Mac OS, uh, it's going to download it. It says x64 over there. Um, now that means that actually I'm downloading the Intel version of this, uh, and uh, which will work on a newer computer. But in fact, I, uh, I probably should have downloaded the Apple Silicon that says ARM64. Different computers have different uh, ways of processing uh, programs and instruction sets and code. And that's actually one of the reasons why Python has become so popular is because with older code, we would uh, need to take that code and turn it into machine language for any given processor. However, with, uh, with Python, we use the code in a Python interpreter, and that interpreter will interpret it for, you know, uh, Mac or Windows or any other, um, any other operating system that can run Python. Now I uh, unzipped that uh, right there, the uh, the GitHub desktop version. And on Mac, it's just an application. We drop it into our applications folder. Uh, as you see, an older item named GitHub desktop already exists in there. Uh, in fact, I'm going to replace that uh, because it is more recent. And uh, in order to do that, uh, I will need to uh, add my administrator password. Just one sec. Uh, and uh, that worked just fine. So now we can see if I go into my applications that there'll be a GitHub desktop there, but we can also just uh, sort of run that. I'm looking for GitHub desktop and it should open up. Uh, on Mac, it gives a security warning. Uh, it says it's downloaded from the internet. Do I want to do it? And then we get this uh, splash screen right here. Welcome to GitHub desktop. Now, in order to do this code, you don't need a GitHub account. Uh, you can simply clone and download the files yourself. However, uh, I will uh, still encourage you to nevertheless uh, uh, configure git this way. And you'll notice that uh, uh, because it already knows my uh, OII address as an account, it shows this down here. Uh, but if you use an email that it's not familiar with, it, it, it'll just be very generic. Uh, and again, that's not you don't have to register for GitHub uh, to do that. What we do do is we want to get started here and clone a repository from the internet. So uh, this right here, uh, once again, sign into your GitHub if you want to do that, but we can just go over to the URL and paste the URL in there. It'll show up under, this is the default one, it'll show up under Documents, GitHub, and then the repository. So over here, if I go to the root directory, introducing Python, you can see here's the splash screen. It's an introductory course on Python and so forth. I take this URL, I copy that, uh, and I go over here and paste it. And so now it's going to take Introducing Python and create a clone of it in my own uh, in my own documents right here. So I clone this, press the button, it's downloading all the files, uh, and that's pretty much all we should uh, be able to see from the GitHub desktop. Now later on, you may um, do something called forking the file if you have a GitHub account, which means then you'll create your own clone on GitHub. Why would you want to do that? Because let's say you want to change the files and push those changes back up to a repository that you keep, you can do that yourself. And uh, as you can see, there's already a, a small number of forks of this where some other people have, uh, uh, have done that. But the important thing now is that we have our files and that we can uh, work with them. You'll notice here it says view the files uh, of your repository in Finder. 
So I'm going to click on that show and finder, Introducing Python. Now, where is Introducing Python? Once again, like I said, GitHub, Documents, and there we go. And that's my, my home directory. Because JupyterLab was launched on my Documents, now we can see here it should show up. Now, you notice it took a little second there to refresh, but it is available. If you don't see it and you expect to see it, try pressing Refresh, and uh, it'll work. If you happen to have been through their home directory, of course, navigate to Documents and GitHub and, and get there. Okay, so I'm now going to open up one of the chapters and have a look at it. Uh, I'll start with the prologue chapter, and uh, yeah, like so. Now, this is a, uh, uh, the prologue chapter really gives a kind of a, a history or a sense of context here. There's not really any code going on in this chapter. There's just some uh, little useful uh, tweaks and uh, stuff. I would uh, recommend that you read this on your own. I'm not going to uh, read it verbatim. Uh, much of this is because it's actually covered already in what I've uh, been saying. Uh, introducing Python, the first chapter, however, uh, I will go a little bit through more carefully in detail. Now, the introductory chapter starts going through some of the similar things that I had uh, shown already. Uh, like, for example, we can now type Python and see uh, this sort of console, as it's called, uh, and you can interact with the, uh, the console. You can also run Python through uh, Python files, which are called .py files, uh, and uh, you can run it, of course, through, uh, uh, through Jupyter. Now, Jupyter, you might wonder, how exactly did we write all of this? It doesn't look like uh, Microsoft Word or anything here. Uh, and what we've done is we've used a, um, a language called Markdown. Uh, now, Markdown is used all over the web, and you'll see it in places where people are asking uh, questions about code uh, because it's a very simple way in which you uh, mark up uh, text. Now, to mark up text uh, from a computer's point of view would be to do things like put something on either side of the text uh, which says this text is special. In order to show some of those uh, features of, uh, of Markdown, I'm actually not going to go into the book here, but instead uh, I'm going to create a new file and we're going to use it as a scratch file. So if I press plus here, uh, this gives me a dialog that says there are some things that I can uh, create and they're going to create it in this folder. So it's going to be in this folder right here. Uh, if I type this, and now I'm going to uh, rename it. But in fact, you can probably rename it just by praying, you know, Command S or uh, I guess Control S on Windows. Uh, and you'll say uh, 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 scratch code examples. So I've now created a new IPython uh, notebook right here. And you'll notice that the notebook has a little green dot by it. That means that this is running on the computer. So this has a series of cells, and uh, the most obvious ones would be code cells. So once again, print, and then we might say, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, there we go. Because I've run that cell, uh, then we have this number one right here that says it's the first command that I've run. And if I go x equals three, uh, then we'll have, that's the second cell I've run. Now, while x equals three, that it didn't give us any feedback, we could, in fact, print uh, x. Now at this point, it's worth uh, considering what are these little parentheses. Uh, this right here, this print statement's in green. Uh, it's in green because it's a function. A function it means it's going to do something uh, to, uh, to the data or to the computer or to the program in some way. Uh, x here in black is a variable. Uh, to say it's a variable means that it's, uh, what it refers to can vary. In this case, it refers to the number three, if I make that a 4, now it refers to the number 4. Uh, I have another variable here. I'm going to make that called y and say equals 5. Uh, and now we can do x plus y. Now in this case, you can see that we've, we're starting to uh, use variables as ways to uh, manage data. Uh, the data that comes in, it's going to be different depending on how we collect it and where we collect it. Uh, but if we want to be able to operate on that data in consistent ways, we can say that it is contained in a variable. So for example, uh, using, um, using comments online, if you go to an online forum uh, and you have the ability to download those comments, you might want to do the same thing for every comment, such as check to see if there's a URL in there or ask how long is the comment. And because you would do that for every comment, uh, you would probably assign the text for a comment as, uh, you know, comment equals, uh, I disagree with you. So I guess a, 
an internet comment. Uh, and then we can, you know, make use of that internet comment later, print uh, comment. Now, uh, as we'll see in the later chapters, there's ways in which we can uh, iterate through many comments using the same variable uh, and do it in ways where we avoid repetition. Uh, for now, though, let's just consider that this is a function and it's going to do something to whatever is in there. Now, to return to what I had suggested before, none of this is Markdown, is it? None of this looks like a, um, you know, like a Microsoft Word document. Uh, it all looks like code. Well, up here in this uh, this actions bar up here, I believe that's what it's called. We'll see in a minute. Uh, we can select the type of cell that we are using. So we have three different types: code, Markdown, and raw. Now, if I make this raw, I can say uh, print comment, and then when I run it, uh, nothing is going to happen. It's just it's just raw text. It comes up in monospace. However, if I have another cell and I turn it into markdown, uh, and then I say print comment, uh, you'll notice that what it did is it formatted it here and it made it format it like like readable text. It's no longer uh, it's no longer monospace. So that really doesn't reveal the fact that it is uh, is uh, it's markdown. It just suggests that we it format the text. So markdown has a series of uh, um, tags, which we'll see in the document itself, and we'll look to them in, in a second, but I just want to see how, show how they're uh, uh, made use of. So you'll notice I have a, uh, of an underscore here, and I put an underscore on the other side, uh, not italic. Uh, so just watch this. This one is a comment, and it's been italicized, and this one is not italic. But what, there was an underscore inside the words right here, didn't seem to notice. The fact is, is that because it's inside, it's not marking it down, uh, or marking it up rather, using markdown. Uh, it's just it's just part of the text. Now, of course, underscores aren't the only thing in markdown. We can have uh, you know asterisks, and that will be bold, uh, or actually italic. I think two asterisks will be uh, yes. There we go. Two asterisks will be bold, and comment and not italic. So these, uh, these markdown cells can get pretty long, uh, but they are a, a really nice way to append text into these notebooks. This way, we can see text and uh, code and the output of the code uh, and even images all within the same document rather than seeing them as uh, separate parts of our, of our workflow. One of the nice things about markdown uh, is that it has headers. And so in order to do a header, uh, we would go here. Here is a header. And in fact, we can have subheaders. Here is a subheader. Now, it doesn't know that it's a header because that's what I called it. It knows it's a header because it has this hash mark at the front. Now, you'll see that the text here is in this, this color blue, uh, and that's because it's not actually thinking of this as a header. Why not? Well, because code uh, is the type of cell that we're in. But if I go back to Markdown, now you see it's in blue. So we see here's a header, here's a subheader, and if I run that, uh, then you can see it looks like this heading here and this subheading down here. Also, if we look over here uh, on these buttons, we, of course we have the file browser, uh, but we also have this second one here, and it says here's a header, here's a subheader. This is now a way of summarizing the headings, and we can see we even can number them uh, by turning that number on and off. Uh, you can have headers inside a cell or across different cells, and so... Uh, a second one. Now, of course, if I run that, nothing shows up uh, because it's still code. If I go up here and make it markdown, uh, then now we have a second header, and we can use that in order to navigate our Jupyter documents. Finally, before I go over to uh, before introducing Python documents itself, I want you to see that the way I ran the cell, uh, you didn't see my mouse move or anything. I was doing that with the keyboard. There are actually three ways to run a cell. So we could say x equals 7, you know, print x. The first way might be to go up here to run. Run selected cells or run all of the cells. In this case, running selected cells, I do that, we get a number 10, and it runs. However, we can also run it through this actions tab right here, which does similar things. First is just run the selected cells or run all the cells. It says restart the kernel and run all the cells. That clears all of our work and runs all of the cells. Now, interestingly, if we restart the kernel and clear all of our work, 
see we got one then these numbers are the number in which they were uh, ran and so uh, it clobbers that's what the term is or replaces the older number if I run this now I believe it'll be 11 yeah there we go so it's the most recent one and this will be the 12th command run and so you can run them out of order which may or may not be a good idea if I hit select uh, this restart kernel and run all cells just watch what happens Okay, it's going to say hello everyone, it prints that, it prints the third, fourth, and so it's running them all in order. Now you'll notice here that I had x plus y equals 9, and I had y equals 5. So now I can, I can change y to be an 8. So x is 4, y is 8. What's this going to be? It's going to be 12. Oh no, it's going to be 15. Why is it 15? What have we done? We actually reassigned x to 7 down here. You'll notice that even though x is above here, the cells are running in a specific order. And so once we have run this one down here, we've reassigned x to 7. So if we go back up here, it's going to assume that's what x is. x is going to be, uh, x is going to be 7, y is going to be 8, and it's 15. Now also watch what happens when I clear all the kernel and run the cells this time. It's going to throw an error. Uh, why do you think it's going to throw an error? It's going to throw an error on this cell right here. It says name Y not defined. Because as it's running them in order, you'll, I, uh, I made a, the old switcheroo here. And so X plus Y is above uh, Y equals 8. This means uh, that this kernel, this new instance of Python, doesn't know what y is uh, until we run it. And then if I go back up here, I can run it again. Uh, now that's important. That means that you have to be careful that you're running your code in the right order in this. Jupyter allows you to run a cell again. If you make, maybe make a tweak in a cell up here, you can run it again and then run the, the cells below. But that also means that your code can get a bit out of sync if you're continually running cells and editing them all over the place. It also helps us highlight the idea that um, what we have here is um, in these cells is an abstraction. The abstraction is uh, there's a set of variables and uh, the kernel knows those variables uh, and we send data to the kernel and it gives stuff back. It's not tied to any given cell, it's tied to a kernel. If we restart the kernel then it'll uh, it'll know Python or know the Python we have, but it won't know about our specific variables. Now that leads us to the fourth uh, of these buttons here, which is this one right here. This is our um, uh, this is where we manage our kernels. So you see, we have three kernels open right here: Prolog, Introducing Python, and Scratch Code Examples, and they correspond to uh, these up here. You can shut down a tab, like a, perhaps I'll do that there for Introducing Python, and uh, uh, I'll, yeah, I'll even do it for the scratch code examples. Uh, you can see here, uh, this is the only tab that's open, but these kernels right here are still running. They're still running in the background. Uh, you can see them on your computer if you, uh, if you go to Activity Monitor or um, I believe the System Monitor on Windows, uh, which you can get to from Control-Alt-Delete. It has little things as what, what's running on your computer. Uh, you might have a lot of versions of Python running, there'll be one version of Python for each of these kernels because it's the Python kernel. So that means that if I, uh, if I open up uh, our scratch code examples here and we see them like this, our, our, let's, uh, it's got all of, our, all of our commands and everything there. And in fact, if we do that and type, you know, print X, uh, whatever. Uh, it knows that it's four. But now just watch what happens if I shut down the kernel. I'm going to restart kernel and clear all outputs. Now if I print X, again, it doesn't know what X is because the, the kernel doesn't know what X is. So that means when you shut down your, uh, your notebooks, you should be mindful that uh, you're not accumulating a lot of kernels, each one taking a bit of space on your, on your, uh, on your computer. It also means that let's say I do something like, uh, say I shut down the kernel here for introducing Python, but the tab is still open. Just watch what this is going to look like. It's going to say no kernel. 
it's not going to be able to run anything. You know, in the in this one, the first thing we do, print the hello world. For on that, it's going to say there's no kernel, so select a kernel. And uh, we really only have uh, these options here now, but Jupyter allows you uh, the support for many kernels, including kernels in languages that aren't even Python. So you can get an R kernel, and you can run in Jupyter uh, R code, except the markdown will be markdown, but the code cells, they will assume are R. So I uh, selected that, I opened up, uh, now it has a kernel here, I run it, and we get our hello world statement. So I'm going to stick here in the, uh, in the introducing Python uh, notebook now that we've had a, a bit of an orientation to, uh, 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 to Jupyter through that scratch code example. Uh, you'll see again they have all the, the green dots. If I right click, I can shut down that kernel uh, from here as well. And if we look at introducing Python, let's have a look at the table of contents. Uh, you know, because this is all done with headers, if we go over here, we have these headers. What is Python? So we already have a sense of this now. It's a, you know, it's a programming language. We can do stuff with it. Uh, and then working with Anaconda and Jupyter. Uh, and this sort of stuff here uh, may or may not be out of date, depending on when you watch this. But in general, you'll want to get the most recent version of uh, Anaconda, generally a 64-bit version. Uh, but these days, that's almost entirely the case. Um, and uh, well, as we've seen the rest of that through our work. Now, getting started with Jupyter Lab, this shows uh, some of the tips for how to navigate or orient yourself to Jupyter. It covers uh, in detail uh, some of the things that we've mentioned, such as this localhost URL, which is a, uh, a URL for a local server on your computer. And then uh, I talk through some of the details here, the browser address bar, uh, Jupyter file menu, as we can see that up here, the navigation uh, sidebar, which is what we've been managing here, the tabs panel uh, up there, and then the actions panel. This is those things that we were doing, like selecting what type of code it is, and so forth. Now, I also point out here the difference between a Python cell and different kinds of cells, uh, and so we should have already have seen that so far. And then finally, code numbers, which is what I've uh, indicated here. These are the numbers indicating uh, which cell was run at which point. We have several subsections here. Uh, the first one is in how to add text to Markdown, and this gives some details about Markdown. Now you notice that we have both an itemized list and a bulleted list. Uh, we can see that right here using one, two, three, four, five, and it will give the numbers. And then this is a sublist. So what's happened is that we've, you know, maybe make it more obvious, spaced it in a little bit. And uh, generally we want to use spaces and not the tab character in Python, but we'll get to that in the next lecture when we talk about strings and lists and so forth. You'll also notice that within Markdown, we can stipulate things being formatted like a computer language. So if you'll say here, uh, tilde, 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 Python, print hello world. When we go over here, uh, we have it printed just like you would see it in a code cell. Now we can't run this, it's not gonna print hello world, it's just a demonstration of what it looks like. You'll also notice that one of the ways in which we indicate that it's like code is because it has these colors. This is an example of what's referred to as syntax highlighting. Uh, most programs today will have syntax highlighting, and that's a really helpful way uh, to indicate the different parts of the program. Uh, and it, where I tend to like syntax highlighting the most is when it works wrong when sometimes uh, things that aren't uh, this text, which we call a string, uh, when something's not a string but it's highlighted in red, or when it's uh, you, you see this print type thing and it's not in green, what that normally means is that we've got some sort of bug or error in the code because this uh, the syntax highlighter is not going to be working uh, effectively. Uh, we'll see examples of that as we go through, but that's something to be mindful when you're uh, debugging. <laughs> It's also relevant to note that uh, Python allows us to, or Markdown rather, allows us to insert uh, additional things like, uh, like math symbols. And so here we have an example of a math symbol here. And as you can see, it gets a bit fussy about that. We have to generally run it twice. Now just watch, I ran it the second time. And instead of what we saw here, this code, uh, we see what it would look like as math notation. And here we have e to the pi i, which is kind of a equals minus one. It's kind of an interesting uh, quirk of, uh, of math formulas and so forth. 
Now, if you're not using uh, math formulae, and I don't tend to use a lot myself, you won't really see uh, the need for too much of this, but it is worth being able to have that at your fingertips. And there are some times when you might want to say something like uh, uh, the variable uh, uh, v sub i, uh, and then that should uh, format this with this little dollar sign as v with a little i underneath it. And see here, why do we get invalid syntax? Because it's not a markdown cell, it's a code cell. So at this point, uh, I'm going to change it, but I'm not going to change it up here. I'm just going to change it with the keyboard. You notice I, I changed it with the keyboard. I selected the, uh, the letter M. The letter M turned this into markdown. And so now I can run this and see it's, it formats itself uh, nicely as so forth. And that's what we have down here, how to create a new cell and navigate with the keyboard. Uh, so you'll notice that uh, Jupyter is modal. And uh, so to say it's modal means that there is uh, there are different modes. Uh, and with different modes, you can do different things in Jupyter. We're in the mode command down here right now. This is kind of a, here we can move around this. I'm using my keyboard uh, to go up and down, and it's going up and down uh, the different uh, cells. If I press, if I press enter, then we, the mode changes, and I can start editing this particular cell. So I press Enter. You'll see now it turns into this, uh, this monospace text for editing. You'll notice down here it says Mode Edit. If you're in the command mode, uh, then, of course, you can not only just move up and down, but you can uh, create new cells. So what I will do here is I'll create a new cell above this one with the letter A. Uh, and we can see here, this is a new cell, it's above. And if I go back, I can create another new cell uh, below with the letter B. And as we see, that's, that's that down there. Now, if I want to delete these, above is A and below is B, can you guess what delete is? Well, it's, it's DD. You have to press it twice. It is D for delete, but you have to press it twice just to make sure. And so I'll do that there, and I'll go up here and uh, delete that key there. You can also write formulas in cells, and I give a sense of how to do that. But that's not really uh, so much of what we would uh, uh, what we would want to follow uh, in this class. But it is, of course, worth uh, getting a sense of that. The formula are the same as the sort of math formula that we would use in a program called LaTeX. LaTeX is a typesetting program, and the PDF version of this book, which we once again to get back where we started, uh, that was uh, formatted with LaTeX. So what I did is I exported to a PDF, or rather exported to an interstitial file format called tech, and then the tech was formatted as, as PDF. Uh, you'll see a lot of LaTeX-based uh, papers, particularly in STEM courses, in math, computer science, and physics, but it's also common in some areas of uh, social science as well. And uh, the, the PDF itself, for details uh, about it, you can have a look in this uh, LaTeX folder, which I actually have a script that shows how I took each one of those chapters, exported them to a single tech file, and then stitched them all together, and made that into this uh, PDF right here. And the PDF, uh, well, not in this program, but in Preview or Adobe, even has nice uh, clickable uh, uh, links to get you uh, navigating through. Finally, the last thing I'd like to show in here before we, we go on is uh, where you might see some things in here that have question marks. Now, we won't see that per se in chapter one, introducing Python, but if we go over to our file browser and go into Prolog, uh, you'll see here that I have um, these question marks right there. Now, what does that mean? Uh, well, that's because I have used, uh, used LaTeX in order to format the book, and LaTeX uses these tags, uh, and tags help reference stuff throughout uh, throughout an, a LaTeX document. So if we double click on here, we see ref chapter intro. So that means that uh, chapter intro introduces some of the basics of Python, which is what we're in. And then chapter data types is going to start with th that sort of thing right there. Now, this is just going to end up as a question mark block in, uh, in Jupyter. But when we look over in the PDF, uh, it should have the correct, like chapter one does this, chapter two does that. Okay. Yes, 
and you can see here. And in fact, because I use those refs, this one, if you're in the PDF itself, you can click on them and it will, it will go to those uh, PDFs. You've noticed that this book uh, is, uh, has some stuff in it that might seem a bit out of date. Like for example, this says Python 3.73, where in fact right now I'm probably running a different version of Python. I believe the most recent version of Anaconda is uh, uh, 3.11, 3.11. That being said, there are no substantive differences uh, within, this, uh, within this book and anything from beyond Python 3.5, I believe. There might be one little tiny thing from 3.7 uh, onward later on. Uh, it's called a walrus operator. It's a new one in, uh, in, in Python, but it's not really a big deal. For, for the most part, you should be able to expect uh, in the coming years that if you have Python 3, all of this will, be, um, all of this will still be uh, accurate. So that takes us to the end of the first uh, two chapters there, the prologue and introducing Python. We haven't really got to the Python coding yet, but hopefully you feel a little bit more comfortable with the environment that you're in and that from here out, we can embark on the various uh, details that we're going to need in order to get programming in Python. Thank you very much.